Um, I'm just going to give you a little introduction about to who is who. Um, Jillian Coley is the co-owner of Wellesley Books in Wellesley, Massachusetts. She and her husband, Bill, bought the store from Brookline, Books, Brookline, Brookline Booksmith in 2010. Jillian is currently on the board of directors for the Wellesley Chamber of Commerce and 826 Boston, a youth literacy organization founded by Dave Eggers. She has served on the New England Independent Booksellers Association Advisory Council and is now the president of its board of directors. Daniel Golden is the proprietor of Milwaukee's Boswell Book Company, which as of August 15th has been open for 3,057 days. Prior to that, he spent 23, 23 years at the Harry W. Schwartz Bookshops, also in Milwaukee. And before that, he spent four years in New York working in publishing. And Linda Marie Barrett is the Assistant Executive Director of SEBA, the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance. Before that, she was for many years the General Manager of Malaprop's Bookstore Cafe in Asheville, North Carolina. Malaprop's Bookstore is a general bookstore in its 36th year of business located downtown, employing between 15 and 20 booksellers. As General Manager, Linda Marie emphasized the importance of customer service revamping the store's hiring and training practices to ensure that all employees embody excellent customer service, part of which is mastering skills of hand selling. Um, just a little housekeeping first. Um, we'd like you to participate, um, but all attendees are in listen-only mode. If you have questions, please type your questions in the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. You have the option of sending questions to the staff or to organizer, please send the questions to staff. Um, our panelists will answer your questions after their presentations. Uh, we are recording this webinar um, and the link will be posted on bookweb.org with session handouts. And we'll also be, um, we're also going to send you the link in an email later on this week. So to start, we're gonna start with um, Jillian Coley of Wellesley Books. Jillian. Hi everybody. I'm Jillian Coley. I'm the owner of Wellesley Books in Wellesley, Massachusetts. We are a general bookstore, um, pretty pretty good size. We're open seven days a week until nine o'clock at night. So we have about 24 employees um, throughout the week, many of whom are part-time. Um, and my husband and I bought the store, as Lisa said, from Brookline Booksmith back in 2010. Um, I personally handle a lot of behind the scenes things. I do all the HR roles um, associated with having a good size staff. I handle the payroll, the healthcare, all the benefits. Um, I do all the bills. The I don't do the buying, but I do handle other publisher relations. Um, and I work on the floor um, with a regular shift and also filling in when necessary uh, throughout the week. And seasonally, of course. We are a suburban community west of Boston. We carry adult books, kids books. We have lots of gift items. We have used books. We have some remainders. So we really get um, all kinds of customers and lots of families. Um, and we serve Wellesley and a lot of neighboring towns west of Boston. Um, most of which are commuter suburbs to Boston. Um, I am also serving as the NEBA president, and so during this period I've had the privilege of working closely with lots of stores throughout New England and seeing the way they do things and how they're different from us and, and all the wonderful alternative ways to handling staff and book selling. And we've learned a great deal from that. So when we bought the store seven years ago, my husband and I had no previous experience with book selling at all. We had to go through the training program, such as it was, um, that any bookseller here in the store would go through. We were very lucky that our experienced staff all stayed on, and so we were able to learn from them. We, for the most part, just shadowed them and watched how they interacted with customers and how they did their job every day and um, learned quickly that there were as many styles of book selling as we had booksellers. Um, so it was important, we felt, and still feel, for new booksellers to work with as many of the current booksellers as possible to kind of uh, absorb their different approaches to 
um, to customers and to selling generally, and also to work at different times of day and different uh, days of the week because patterns really change throughout the week and the day in terms of who's coming in and what kind of things they're asking for. Um, you know, whether it's days that we're getting lots of special orders arriving and we're dealing with calling customers on that or talking to the ones who come in and, and then processing the books that they purchase that way or decide not to. And so just to make sure that booksellers get an overview of all parts of the business, it's really, I think, a good idea to expose them across the board throughout the week um, to as many people as possible. What we did observe as we were learning ourselves amongst our booksellers is that there was a certain reluctance to view themselves as salespeople, um, that booksellers are book people and they want to read books and they want to talk about books, um, but they're a little conflicted about really selling books and sometimes forget that that when it boils right down to it, that's what needs to happen at the end of those wonderful conversations that they have with our customers. Um, and sometimes natural enthusiasm is enough, and sometimes it can be supplemented with other techniques that make a sale more likely. So we do, we've worked with our booksellers and encouraged them um, that, you know, without a hard sell approach to... Uh, offer customers more than they think they want when they come through the doors. There are a lot of opportunities to uh, increase the sale that doesn't that don't feel like high pressure, which most of us are adverse to. Um, we like to try and pair books together so that if a customer is interested in something in particular, that we help them find another book along a similar theme or perhaps by the same author, that complements the one they've already selected. Um, we, we stress to our booksellers that it's important to present that second book as an addition and not as a substitution, because it's, it's easy to fall into a, oh, did you read their first one, which then is likely to be a paperback, and perhaps we've lost that hardcover sale. So, uh, re so we often refer to pairings like that as companion books and present them as something that will go nicely with a wonderful book that they have already selected. Uh, we do sell a lot of non-book items here, and there are some really obvious ways to pair those with both books and with other gift items. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, a year ago, we had the luxury of the coloring book craze and the colored pencils as we could match with those were an obvious way to have people walk out with a couple of things instead of just the one they came in for. But um, more recently, being in New England, we have had enormous success with Tom Brady socks. We don't let any sports fan out of the store without making sure that they're aware that we have those. Um, those are unique to our, our store, but every region there's opportunities to find favorite items that are going to be a good match for for your own customers. Um, we carry the litographs of classic novels, which are a, a great pairing with those books if people seem to have an interest in um, one of the books that is featured with the litographs. So we're always looking for opportunities to to match things together and make the sale just a little bit bigger. Uh, it is important that the booksellers are comfortable doing it and feel that they're using their own personal style. We never try and put words in anybody's mouths. We just want to make sure that there's a consistent message coming from the store all the time. Because we uh, worked with experienced booksellers when we first took over the store, uh, there was a little bit of balking at some of the changes that we wanted to implement. Um, but it doesn't take long. People will give it a try to get comfortable with new language, new wording, even things as simple as asking customers if they would like a bag instead of just automatically bagging things, which met with a little bit of resistance because old habits die hard and, and everyone has their patter and their, and their banter um, and felt that they weren't comfortable asking and that it should just be something that's handed 
out in a complimentary way. Within a week, nobody was looking back. It became second nature. So I would encourage uh, everyone to try new things, even if it takes them a little bit out of their comfort zone at first. Uh, special orders are something that we we work hard to make customers comfortable with. We found that often they are reluctant to put us to any trouble. We know we're happy to order those books in there for them, but as soon as we use the word special, then often they'll back off. Oh no no no! Don't you know? Don't worry about it. Um, and so we de-emphasize the the term special. We don't refer to that refer to them that way to our customers. Um, we don't make it seem as though the book's difficult to get in any way. So when I'm looking up the book for them, uh, they may think I'm looking in our system to see if it's on our shelves, but I've already established that it's not, and I'm busy checking for its availability and the timing, so that if I know we can easily get it, I can imply that it's already in the pipeline. I can say that it's, that it's in the warehouse, um, and, you know, for all they know, we have a big warehouse. Um, or I can say we're expecting it in a couple of days. And that just seems to make people feel more comfortable. If we're expecting it, can I set one aside for you when it comes in? They're very quick to say yes because they don't feel they're asking us to take extra steps on their behalf. So the language around that can, can make a big difference. Um, Finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about the awkward situations when customers come in and they're you know, show, essentially showrooming us, sometimes overtly, sometimes covertly, uh, or they'll just walk up and ask us if we sell Kindles, if they can get something on a Kindle. Um, it's infuriating, but it often comes from ignorance. And at least we assume that it does until we have reason to think otherwise. Uh, we believe it's really important not to get confrontational um, with customers over that or anything really. But um, it's because it's a subject we and our booksellers feel so emotionally about. It is really touchy. It's really hard to get into a discussion of without sounding self-righteous or, or as though we're sour grapes, we're just upset because we're losing money to them, um, we don't want to shame anybody. So we tread very carefully with that. We try and keep all conversations positive, highlighting the benefits of shopping local, um, talking about our contributions to schools and community efforts, um, teams, little league teams and Girl Scouts and all sorts of um, activities that go on here in town. We talk about keeping jobs locally. We talk about how our taxes support local endeavors. Um, we talk about author events that we're able to host that um, obviously can only happen in unity stores. I mean, you all know know all of this, but often the customers don't, and they haven't really thought about it, and they are quick to, um, you know, to, to really make an effort to absorb it and, and think about it and at least perhaps out of embarrassment they will buy something. Uh, occasionally there are the folks who are truly truly know what they're up to and they're taking pictures and they're making lists or they'll make lists during a conversation with a bookseller and then choose at the time not to buy anything and it's not so hard to figure out what's going on there. Um, Again, because it's such an emotionally charged topic, at least around here, and it is hard to strike the right right note, we often will let that slide because we don't want to risk alienating our customers or other customers who are in there and can hear everything that's going on. But sometimes, if I see somebody taking pictures in the store, I will ask them in a friendly way, you know, what they're going to do with their pictures and hope we're putting, they're putting us on their social media, making some kind of posting, featuring us and kind of giving them the benefit of the doubt. Um, and often they are, and then we feel better. <laughs> um, and if they're not, they kind of know we're aware and they maybe hang their heads uh, a little bit, but there's only so much you can really do. Sometimes after we've had a long conversation helping somebody and making what we think are inspired suggestions for them and they're jotting it down or making mental notes and then they turn to walk away with nothing, we will we will follow up with a kind, you know, I do hope you'll consider buying some of these buying something here so that we can carry on having conversations like this. 
um, it's really it's really just trusting your gut on on the day of to make sure that it nothing comes out too sharply. So those are my suggestions, and I'm happy to answer any questions. But I will um, pass you along to Daniel for now. Thank you. Thank you, Jillian. Um, now we're going to hear from Daniel Golden of uh, well of um, Boswell Book Company. Daniel. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I am, yes, there's a picture of the store. Um, it, we opened in 2009. The store itself had been a Harry W. Schwartz book shop, shop since 1997, and the stores actually started a block away from us in the 20s. In between, uh, there were at least um, three other wonderful bookstores on the block and one comic book store which is actually the only time Neil Gaiman's ever signed books in Milwaukee, as a little footnote, um, to my knowledge. Uh, we're a general interest bookstore. We're about 8,000 square feet, maybe a little smaller than that. Uh, we have a good kid section. We're near, we're near a university and also in a neighborhood where a lot of other academics live. Um, we do a lot of programming, um, and uh, most of which involves authors, but not all of it. Uh, we do a lot of community work with a lot of local organizations. We do a lot of school authors and school programs, and um, and we, you know, so we do heavily market the store. But even though we do a lot of programming outside the store, uh, my feeling is that everything should have as its end goal uh, convincing somebody to start shopping at the store by coming in because we think we have a nice store. So. Um, and once people are in there, we really, 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 really hope they buy something. So I um, am talking about um, tools for hand selling. Um, uh, I agree that um, booksellers are sometimes frightened of of selling books, but you know, my what I always say to people is this is really what they want to hear. For the most part, the people who didn't want to interact with um, with uh, booksellers and get ideas. Um, those people are shopping online. Those people that we used to have who really hated anybody talking to them. Most most people do like some interaction, um, and they also want knowledge, and they also want to dis they want discovery. Once again, if they knew exactly what they want, they'd be less likely to shop with us. And so here are we want to offer as many tools as possible to our uh, booksellers um, as they can um, can to do the best job. Um, one thing that's really important. I'm mostly talking about um, frontless titles here. Is um, lots and lots of advanced reading copies. Um, we are flooded with them, um, as are many bookstores. We get the box from American booksellers. We're on various mailing lists. Um, sadly, it feels like about 80% of them are psychological suspense. So if you like that genre, that's really great. If you like something else, it's a little complicated. But there are different ways to get books closer to your field of interest. Um, we um, uh, Edelweiss uh, obviously offers um, e-galleys now. Um, uh, many publishers will respond to requests. Um, there are offerings from um, the American Booksellers Association. Um, and uh, of course, there's many books available at regional um, and national trade shows. Um, one suggestion that I have is um, I often go to these shows and think about books from my booksellers and try to go the extra mile and get them signed by the author to that bookseller with the um, my uh, crazy theory that if the book signed to you, you have to read it. Um, we also um, try to keep our booksellers informed. We give each bookseller an email address through the store and subscribe them to Shelf Awareness and Publishers Weekly. Um, and this sort of, because I feel like a bookseller who is knowledgeable will be able to find the books that they want. And also, even if they haven't read a book, will more likely recognize a book that the person only knows some vague detail about, and they can now offer it to the, you know, they can discover it and seem uh, smarter than they did before. Um, another resource that we find that's available is sales reps. I feel like um, sales reps are sometimes underutilized. Um, I know a lot of sales reps who are um, doing a great job really want direct connections with booksellers, and we're pretty much, uh, we pretty much love that. I, I would like a book sales rep to occasionally pull me aside if somebody's asking for cartons of books, 
But um, we also find that sometimes a sales rep can recommend a title that a bookseller will read that either one of my buyers, Amy or Jason, or I have already suggested to them or put in a galley offering. Um, our buyers, um, I also find that we can put a book on the shelf and someone won't pick it. But if Jason or Amy send out a note with a little description about the book, which they do uh, make these lists through Edelweiss uh, several times a month, uh, they'll get a lot of requests on them. So once we have, we that we really know that uh, there are definitely levels that you want. Um, you want uh, a shelf talker and you, the best thing of all is to get somebody to write something down because then not only do they have, uh, are they not in the store talking about it, but you're helping sell the book everywhere. So uh, once we get the rec, you know, obviously uh, two months before the book's um, out, there is the Edelweiss um, deadline, but we do, recommend to our booksellers, uh, the mantra is review as early as possible, because we find that the earlier we do it, the more it helps the book, the more it helps the author, and maybe it might be in the galley, maybe it might be an ad, uh, maybe it will convince other booksellers to read the book. Um, so you're sort of wholesale hand selling. Um, we have uh we do have a bookseller that sends out the type the uh the deadlines and uh you know, my booksellers uh, get really excited when it's there. So there is a reward in that. I know some people do financial compensation. I actually, after reading Freakonomics, decided not to. You can read the book and learn why. Um, we have a staff rec section. It's actually pretty large. I think altogether it's five cases. Um, the full-time booksellers have a shelf and the part-time booksellers is about 20 people in the store altogether have a half shelf. Uh, plus we use shelf talkers around the store as well. Sometimes they're a little sloppy. I have tendency to like everything in our store is, you know, computer draw, uh, written except for our shelf talkers, which are all um, handwritten. Um, even if you can't read it, it there's a perception that, um, somebody likes it and they're aware of it. Um, I do think it's important to curate an update. I think sometimes we're good at that, sometimes we're not. Uh, I do have booksellers um, replace their shelf talkers and in a perfect world, we'd be looking at them and pulling them if they weren't working. Uh, we try to duplicate all our shelf talkers online on our website. We put tons of um, recommendations there and try to link to them on our email newsletters. Um, and we also try to let people know uh, when their shelf talker is working just in case they're not paying attention. Um, I, it's my perception that um, while you might be able to hand sell a paper easily in hardcovers, sometimes people need uh, th two to three recommendations. And so that shelf talker might be a way of getting uh, two or three recommendations for the same book um, at the same time. So we might have a theme table with the book on it. We might have a bestseller list with the book on it. We use, uh, we have a case of indie bound recommendations. We have a book club read it, what the book clubs are reading recommendation um, case, and someone might see the book over and over again and then come out with it. Um, our staff rec, um, I know some people do typeset. Some people uh, put them in um, shelf talker, like um, plexi shelf talkers, which look really great. Um, and um, I, I would just say that uh, for an example, with uh, we're not in the Appalachian, but we sold 32 copies of Crapalachia. Um, and that was from one of my booksellers, Rex. And, uh, but also we got an idea to do a what to read after a hillbilly elegy table. And it went front and center on that and helped sell a lot of books. We kind of have um, cooperative goals, which I find um, useful. Uh, we share our progress with booksellers on Treeline when we're selling books well. Uh, I really like when uh, multiple people read the same book and recommend it. A lot of my booksellers, their inclination is if somebody read it, they shouldn't read it and recommendation, recommend it. But I find that lots of people reading the same book actually helps the book sell lots better than just one person recommending it. Um, one book that we had five recommendations on that we're hoping to sell a lot of books at Christmas is, uh, if you don't know the words, by Bianca Murray. Um we sold, I think, about 250 copies of Readers of Broken Wheel. We were number one for a while on Treeline. I do look at this stuff all the time. We're like five because there's some stores in the, in the mountain region that pulled ahead of us. One of the things I find with booksellers is they do have um, short, they lose, if you don't keep on pushing a book um, to them to remind them that they like it, they sort of lose interest and move on to the next. We have had some friendly competitions with backlist hand selling. Um, we did have a wonderful um, event where we pit, pitted teams of two groups of people 
uh, selling The Illusion of Separateness against Transatlantic um, and wound up selling a ton of copies of both. Obviously, that was several years ago. And we haven't done it yet. So it's part of the uh, those who can't do teach variety. Um, I do really love displays of books that reinforce the books that people like. So we had a, a What to Read After a Man Called Uva, and I let booksellers pick the books for that. We just we did a Books for Living table for Will Schwabe's uh, book, and we just start, um, put up a table for Bill Goldstein's book um, because I have a lot of booksellers who like classics uh, for the When the World Broke in Two with the six authors featured in that. Um, and then, then we can put the staff, that's another place for them to put staff recommendations. Um, I think those are my tools. I hope somebody comes away with something interesting. I'm done. Okay, um, thank you, Daniel. And I'm sorry, I got kind of lost there, Marie. Hold on a minute, Linda Marie, and I'll go back to you. Here we go. So Linda Marie is um, the current is currently with SIVA, and she is formerly of Malaprop's bookstore. Um, so um, Linda, would you like to discuss um, your sales techniques for what you did in Malaprop's? Sure. Um, Malaprop's is a general bookstore located in downtown Asheville. And because of the downtown location in a city that's really popular as a tourist destination, there's a lot of foot traffic into the store. And so that's what Malaprops has to take advantage of with excellent hand selling is that foot traffic. I was general manager at Malaprops for the last 15 years and when we did this panel at Winter Institute, but I recently became the assistant executive director of the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance. And one of my roles there is called Rep on the Road. And I travel to our member stores and find out what's going well and what isn't. And it's really helpful education. So. Today I'm sharing what we did at Malaprops regarding hand selling, but I'm also adding in some tips from around the territory. Um, I'm gonna echo, echo what Daniel and Jillian said about the reluctance to be salespeople, but I think that's something we really need to embrace because being great at hand selling books allows you to pay your staff well, take risks with your sidelines, invest in your business and be innovative. So it's a skill you have to take as seriously as your title selection and merchandising and community outreach. So when hiring, it's really important to look for friendly, positive people. It's important to love books, but you also have to love interacting with people too. And at Malaprops, we expect everyone to be skilled salespeople, and we make clear our expectations for excellent customer service right at the beginning. Because if the store is not a fantastic place to spend time in, your customers will go online and they will not be going to your online site, most likely. So during the job interview, I put forward questions to candidates to elicit a sense of their personality and, and how they work with people and approach people, including during a crisis, because as you know, crises happen at bookstores. So here are some questions that I would ask during interviews. Um, one of them is, We've all been on the receiving end of a bad customer service experience. Describe one you had that was particularly memorable. How did you follow up? Tell me about a time when things didn't go the way you wanted, like a promotion you wanted and didn't get, um, possibly a major assignment or project that didn't turn out how, you, how you'd hoped. What did you learn from that experience? Describe a crisis you faced at work or in an academic set setting. What was your role? How did you resolve it? What were the results? What things do you not like to do? What do you like to do? What qualities in your coworkers bother you most? What qualities do you appreciate the most? And I think through those kind of questions, you get a good sense of the personality of the potential bookseller. Um, once we begin training, one of the main things we stress is authentic customer engagement. We aim to be the best thing that happens to a customer that day. Um, warm, inviting customer service is very rare, as many of you know, outside of the hospitality industry. And we found at Malaprops that excellent customer service creates repeat, fiercely loyal customers. I used to joke that we were like dogs wagging our tails at Malaprops because we're so happy to see you. And there are some people at the store who almost do wag their tails. Um, we aim to be deeply engaging with customers, and we do that by following some Zingerman principles. Zingerman's is a deli in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and they wrote a book that I highly recommend called Zingerman's Guide to Giving Great Service. 
treating your customers like royalty. The book is a quick read, and we have all of our new employees read it and model its principles. It's out of print, but you can get out of print copies, and I've also heard there are great videos too. So here are some of our tips from Zingerman's, and they're really simple and easy to remember. The first one is the 10-4. Eye contact with customers at 10 feet, verbal contact at four feet. You're showing customers that their presence makes a difference. And you can use this time of initial verbal contact to let them know that you're there for them. Maybe ask them for assistance, if they need assistance, or are looking for a particular book. The next one I think is probably the most important is active listening. We find out exactly what the customer wants. You listen, you don't interrupt, you note their body language, and you dig deeper with questions if it seems appropriate. You will make a connection with that customer and they will come back. Think about some of your best experiences as a customer at a store or a restaurant. Didn't it usually involve someone who was really listening to you and trying to help you? And go the extra mile. Write down similar titles you think they'd love, give them an ARC, wrap their purchases, offer to carry their purchases out, out to the car, give their dog a doggy treat, or give them a high five if you're so inspired. Um, think about the ways you can reward customers and make their day a little more special. Um, other ways that we increase sales is to engage with customers while on the sales floor. And this means getting out from behind the bookstore counter because that counter can be a barrier in more ways than one. So after the initial 10-4 contact, you find the customer on the sales floor and find out what they're looking for. And by offering assistance, nine times out of 10, the customer needs your help and you'll find what they're looking for. And another obvious but important thing is handing the desired item to them. Once you hand a customer a book or a sideline, they begin to bond with it. So don't just wave your hand at the shelf and to point out a book for them. Another important one is do not judge. Try not to judge your customer's tastes. Instead, be honoring of their needs and guard your facial expressions. We also try to stay out of political discussions, especially now, and seek the help of other booksellers for genres you're not familiar with. It's really good to have a go-to list of questions in your mind to ask customers when they're stalled. Um, some of mine were, what is the last book you read that you really liked? Why did you like that book? What kind of read are you looking for? Light, serious, escape, fantasy? Whenever I was stumped, I led customers over to the staff picks or the book club sections because um, staff picks and book club areas tend to be a great variety of books and they're vetted by serious readers in the store and in the community. Your use of language and your body language is very important too. Um, think about how a customer would hear what you're saying and avoid being negative or sounding exasperated or try to avoid showing any kind of burden in your body language. If we look like we're put upon, they probably won't want our help. And um, like Jillian mentioned, we're careful with language. So we don't say, we can order that book from a distributor. We say, we can bring that in for you from a warehouse, from our warehouse actually. Or we say, we're out of that book rather than we don't carry that. Some other tips are recommending similar books to the one they want or recommending a gift item that is a perfect pairing. And don't be shy about this because you'll actually increase their joy about it. I never in my 30 years of book selling had a customer come up to me and complain that I pushed a book or a sideline item on them. Um, don't project your budget onto customers. I used to do this when I first started out and was on a strict budget. And I'd say things like, this book is pretty expensive as I was handing over a gift book to them. And I'm sure that also showed in my body language. Or I'd try to slow someone down who was obviously in a buying frenzy. And then it occurred to me, why was I staging interventions? Imagine if a clerk tried to talk you out of a beautiful scarf because they thought you couldn't afford it. Wouldn't that make you feel sad or weird? So let your customers happily spend a lot of money. Another tip is to be confident and not wishy-washy with your recommendations. Imagine a clerk recommending a bottle of wine and saying, I'm not sure if you'll like this as they handed it to you. Would you buy it? Who is a better, who's better than a bookseller to pair books with customers? 
um, make use of the time at the register to get to know them better because they'll remember that. And I always remember that as a shopper. Um, I can't tell you how many times that conversation led to an extra sale because I realized there was another book they would love, that companion book that Jillian mentioned, or they remembered something else they needed to buy, like a birthday card or a gift for a friend. It's also important, and this would happen at Malaprops, and we had to remind ourselves to stop doing this because we enjoyed each other's company so much, is to stop talking to your coworker and to look up from the computer when a customer approaches. You need to be present for them. And lastly, this is like the golden rule for me, is put yourself in your customer's shoes. The main thing to remember is to think about your own good and bad customer service experiences in other stores or in a restaurant or another bookstore and put yourself in your customer's shoes. Think about how you would like to be treated and then model that with your customers. And that's it for me. Uh, thank you, Linda Marie. Um, so we are, our presentation is over. It looks like we don't have any questions. Um, so I'd like to ask Daniel and Jillian and Linda Marie if you have anything extra that you'd want to add after listening to your, your colleagues' presentations or anything else to close on. Hmm. I thought Daniel's tip about signing up all of your new staff to Shelf Awareness and Publishers Weekly and Book Selling This Week is a great way to create more engagement with new titles and more recommendations to customers about these titles. Mm. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Okay, looks like we might have a question. Um, give me a sec here. Do you see it? Okay. Can I pull this down? Oh. Sorry for the delay. Here it is. You're right. Okay, so here's the question. Uh, any of any of you three could answer it. Um, the question is, how do you sell a genre you you really don't know much about? Um, may I? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, well, we I do really take advantage. One of the things I always say um, as a pal, like a corollary of that is people want to know what I think about a book. I don't care if it's good. I want, you know, I don't care what the reviews. I just want to know what Daniel thought. And I sometimes I want to, you know, in certain genres, I'll say, I'm not the right reader for this book. If you like, you know, if you like fantasy, you need to listen to what our buyer Jason says. And if you like graphic novels, you have to live and listen to what Olivia or Peter say. And you know, so one of the things that, one of the nice things about having staff racks around the store is that we use them and, sh and um, as well as the staff X sections is we use our other booksellers all the time. Um, but the other nice thing is, you know, if you're getting, you know, if we're circulating things like um, uh, the indie bound recommendations and things like that, um, we're, we're basically using booksellers from all over the country. We're using reviews, uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, we have, circulate the New York Times book review and that kind of thing like that. Now, it's a little tricky when what if you have a genre like romance that you don't see a lot of reviews on and maybe you don't have a bookseller on staff. And, may, you know, what we try, you know, what we would love to do is have, you know, if you get a question every six years, it's not worth doing anything. But if you get a question every other month, maybe you should be more knowledgeable. One of the things that I found is I traditionally hadn't read uh, mysteries as a bookseller, and I found that there were so it was so requested of me to read mystery, you know, to know what I thought of mysteries and thrillers. And the fact that um, one thing I will, another tip I will say is that um, it is really easy to hand tell mysteries um, to customers. Like they listen to you, and not only that, they buy the whole series. So it's so time effective that I found myself spending more time reading mysteries and thrillers because when it works, you can sell a ton more books than when you sell, when you try to, I, I, this is so sad. I love short stories. I still read them, but they're harder to sell than mysteries. So that's one thing. Read, read in the air yourself. 
find have a backup selection. So if you say you have nobody who reads science fiction or romance, but you do get a lot of requests, you might not get a lot of requests for for um, contemporary romance. You certainly get a lot of requests for historicals in general, historical fiction. Come up with a little checklist of five or ten books that you either post publicly. I've seen this in other stores, or you keep behind the desk. Here are five go-to books that people like that maybe people don't know about, maybe not something so obvious. So it's along the lines of that man called Uva Table. It's like, we know everybody read that. Maybe there's something they want to read besides the other Frederick Bachman books. That's it. Thank you, Daniel. Um, we have some other questions that have come in now. So um, here they are. Did each of you have a dress code? Um, do you use dress for success? Does anyone want to answer that one? Malaprops had a dress code, but it wasn't, I'm not sure what dress for success is, but it, it was, we did want people to look like professional booksellers because I think that's part of being taken seriously when you're recommending books. So there were some, some form, some outfits, like a skirt that was too short or clothing that's torn that we, that we asked people to avoid that so that they would be more respected, their opinions would be more respected and they'd have a more professional presentation of self. So a guideline more than a dress code specifically. Yes, yes. Um, and then someone also asked Linda Marie, uh, what is the 10-4 contact? Again, if you could refresh us on that, the 10-4 contact rule. 10-4 is um, you make visual contact at 10 feet and verbal contact at 4 feet. And that way, every customer that comes into the store, you recognize them in some way. Thank you. Uh, another question, um, how do you advise your booksellers to deal with customers who are rude or disrespectful? Does anybody want to try, try answering that one? I can try. I think the other people would be better than me, but I'll give, I can give them a running start and they can correct <laughs> all the things I say wrong because that's usually the way. I, so um, we, we kind of watch how things, how interactions are going and tell our booksellers to kind of ask for help at the front desk or say, or try to get out of the situation such that they can get a manager to the front desk. I think we're generally relatively well off. Um, one of the things that um, I like to say to booksellers in terms of, you know, because a lot of times it's not that they said, you know, if somebody says something clearly over the line, uh, abusive, racist, sexist, that kind of thing, we'll, you know, we have, we will bring the manager, you know, they'll bring the manager over and we'll handle it in a proper fashion. We generally don't have that. People, tend to more just say obnoxious thing, you know, things to kind of get kind of that twist a little or get mad about little slights or, or things like uh, my, here's my coupon for seven years ago. Why aren't you um, using it or better than that? Here's a, here's a gift card for a store that closed two years ago. Why aren't you taking that? Um, and what I find is that it's very helpful for the bookseller to have the right attitude about it and not take it personally. Um, it's pretty common advice because just about every bookseller, uh, books, person who wants to be a bookseller knows exactly what to say at the interviews about knowing that they don't know what happened to the person before they came in and they might be taking out their own problems and blah, blah, blah. And yet when you go on the floor, you forget all the stuff you said in the interview and you take it very personally. Um, but we have, we just, we just remind booksellers to that, you know, if they're having problems to just get help and get, and also that if there's a book, if there's a customer that says tends to treat them in a way that consistently like, whereas, we might not be able to call attention to it is just say you don't have to help a person like if somebody keeps going up to you and asking you obnoxious questions like i said not crossing the line but still irritating um you know in most cases we have enough staff that you can hand that person off to somebody all right correct me <laughs> um linda marie did you have anything to add to that i do um well, I think that it's really good to have language that you've already t given your employees for certain kinds of situations so that they feel comfortable. And also, 
empower them to be able to deal with the situation without fear of punishment from management. I mean, if it's really, if whenever they want to hand it off to a manager is fine. We also have very, we're located downtown. So I think unlike, I don't know your situation, Daniel, but at Malaprops, we, we do have to deal with a lot of difficult situations more often. And so we have the non-emergency police number located close to the phone. And if ever anyone feels threatened in any way, I always recommended that just go ahead and call because the police are happy to come down and just walk through the store. But if it hasn't reached that level of concern, um, we empower employees to handle situations however they deem necessary to be protective of themselves. And um, again, giving them language. We also got good language from ABFA about how to de deal with people who are harassing the store because of its book selection or maybe what they perceive as its political bias. And that, that's a situation where it's good to have certain language so that staff feel comfortable um, speaking with the customer. And we generally take, if it's a difficult conversation, we usually move away from the counter. And then when I was there, I would always walk the person right out the front door while in conversation just to get them out of the store. And that was really effective. Thank you, Linda Marie. Jillian, I think Jillian had to leave us. Jillian, are you still with us? No, she's she's no longer here. Okay, um, another question from a bookseller who wants to know um, how much your window displays affect your sales. Um, do you want to go first or do you want me to? Um, we What we find is that it is uh, definitely cumulative and it's definitely, um, you know how the, uh, the old um, stickiness um, argument that some some things sell out of windows much better than others. Um, we really try to, um, we have a big window which has um, a rotating display. Sometimes it's a really great display. Sometimes it's a really lackluster nothing display. Um, usually focused around a larger upcoming event. We tend to try to put regional, make a regional window in the summer when we have the smallest tourism bump in America, but it is notice, you know, slightly noticeable. Um, and then we actually, we really focus our windows on our um, events. So we have like eight, we have four windows that are divided in half and we put the next eight upcoming events in there. So it's really, it's really, it's hard to say that the book sold out of it. So people will come in and ask us about events from it. So I think that there is some, um, some movement from it. Um, I am a fan of Paco Underhill's um, Why We Buy and um, really followed a lot of his guidelines about the size of signage and what you say. You know, it's tricky for us because we use the same signage for our, you know, we have a little tiny bit in the door, but very little. We have a vestibule, we have a displays inside, and we have window displays. And often we don't have the energy to make a different different signage for everything. Um, but we think we think about it and sometimes like for certain kind of signage cut cut the amount of copy. Um, we also don't have the best foot traffic. Oddly enough, we're actually in the city of Milwaukee, which is not the safest place in the universe. But it's a weird little neighborhood that where um you know the the crazy people try to come and i don't mean that and i shouldn't say that but there there's a lot of people with mental illness and you know there's a second housing they tend to come one at a time so that we can handle them which we really appreciate so um so yeah i i would say uh eh, I, I i can't tell that was way too long to say nothing sorry <laughs> linda marie will do a better job i'm not sure but i'm all, i'm also a big fan of paco underhill's book and um, when I was at Malaprops, I started a book club for the managers, and that was a book we all read together. And it's, again, I think it's another golden rule of looking at the store through the eyes of a customer. And one way you do that is looking at your front window and imagine you're a customer walking by. So most of what the hottest selling titles at Malaprops were the ones that were in the front, like 20 feet of the store. We use the windows like Daniel did for our, our dis events. And that's good because they're always rotating. So there's always something new in the window. And I think that's really appealing and inviting. But it, I think it's also important to not have so much in the window that you can't see into the store and see movement in there because other, otherwise it's kind of blocking. 
but I, I do think that area is really important, what's, what you can see through the windows, and to make sure that your windows are really clean and the whole area around the displays in the front window is very clean. Thank you. Lisa, can you hear me? Yeah, hi, Jillian, you're back. Hi. I know I was never gone. I could hear you, but I seem to have dropped off. Anyway, I've oh. dialed back in. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so just, just on that same note, yeah, yeah um, I was just going to say I, I definitely agree with the idea of being able to see through the windows. So it's a, it's a little bit of a conflict here because it is a great place for people to see as they're driving down the street or coming along the sidewalk. And we do use it sparingly for events. Occasionally, when we're really anxious about attendance, we'll put great big letters across the windows so that you can be at the stoplight down the street and still see it. And that actually is very effective. But day to day, I like people to be able to look through and inside and see books and see an inviting place um, where that we hope will draw them in. So we struggle for that balance. Oh, can I just mention one more thing? To uh, we don't cover our windows at all. So we the the display windows on the other side they're all half windows, so they go up a little bit. We actually and we don't actually think people will see the sign. We just repeat. We just do like a repeating image of the hardcover books that we put on display. Mm -hmm. We have like little shelves, and I, I completely agree. Like our idea is like we want people to see into the store, but more and 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 to say that well, we pay a lot of attention. Uh, and that's also from the Underhill on like what people see when they first walk in the store. Yes. Um, and, I, and I'm also often at that point focusing on the customer's impression of the store as a whole as opposed to selling something because at that point what I mostly want them to do is keep walking into the store and I can worry about selling to them later. Right. Um, here's a question about shelf talkers. Um, do you think it's better to have shelf talkers together that are alike or different? We don't make any like, effort to make to to put them together by theme or in really it's a pretty varied selection and it's almost on our on our dedicated shelf talker bookcase we really do it chronologically so that it's newer things at the top we kind of rotate them down so that it stays fresh but it can be absolutely anything when people approach anyone else on that well, one. Go ahead. Um, I think, when the oh, yeah, go, Linda Marie, you go. I'll just be brief, but I think shelf talkers, they remind me of the tags you see in wine shops that from Wine Spectator or other ones that just draw your eye. And I think they're, however you use them, to use them and make sure to use them because they're such a good form of a, a really subtle and passive form of hand, hand selling that really works. Okay, thank you. Here's here's a question about um, a training manual. Uh, a bookseller wants to know how you keep yourself fresh, especially um, with new staff. Do you have a training manual and any suggestions on how to build one if you do? I can answer it. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, we have a training manual and we model it on um, Seattle's bookstore, uh, Elliott Bay. They have a passport that they put all new booksellers through for training. And I heard about this passport when I was a pan on a panel with someone there and she sent it to Malaprops. And then an um, assistant manager there modeled a training manual for Malaprops on that. And now every bookseller goes through the passport when they're, when they're hired and trained. So that way we know that we've consistently covered every area that we need to. And that by the time that bookseller is put out onto the sales floor, which usually is after about seven to ten days of training that they are very immersed in, in our expectations they're very grounded in malaprops um a qu follow-up question for that um linda marie uh someone who is not familiar with elliot elliot bay's passport they want to know what you mean by passport so it looks like a passport in that it's a little booklet with lots of pages and each page of the passport will be an area of of um training in the store, like one might be um, answering phone calls, shelving books, um, how to look up a book on our inventory system. You know, it'll just be very specific areas of, of training. And, uh, and you could email Malaprops and see if they will also share their new passport. But I'm using the word passport, but it's essentially a training manual that looks like a little passport. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have an answer for that question or should we move on? 
we 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 could do a better job but we have we have a checklist a training checklist that we keep track you know that we use um but we don't have a good manual so yeah same we, we have, have a, a, a rather out of date uh booklet but it could certainly use some revision um here's a question um from someone going back to the uh the difficult um, customer situation. What if you are I, the sole proprietor in a store, um, and they are they are excessive talkers, or et cetera? How how do you help them to move on? Any you mean it's one person and they're and they're stuck up at the counter? Yeah. Well, we have a at Malaprops. There's a good thing that we have speaker phone, so. If we can sense that someone's stuck with a customer, we'll call from another phone and um, say the phone is for them. But if you're a sole proprietor, I think it's good to think up language in advance for how to handle that. What you could say to that you have an appointment or that you need to focus on a certain project right now because you're under deadline. I don't know if Daniel and Jillian have other tips. I'm, you know, I it's you know usually. I, what I always say to my booksellers, because this happens with friends coming in, this happens with customers, and I basically tell them they can, they don't even have to think about, they give, they can give five minutes to anybody, you know, like even a person who knows what they're doing, we, you know, who we do know just comes in and chats with them and just leaves and will never, ever, ever buy anything. Um, you know, everybody gets five minutes. When I, I have a particular problem in that a lot of people like to talk to me and tell me long stories and I'm pretty upfront with them. And I just say, oh, God, I love talking to you. Um, and then Mark remarked on something they just said that was really, 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 really great. And I say, but oh my gosh, I've, I have so much to do today. And I, I'm, you know, you, if we want to keep the store open, I've got to get, I've got to get it done. So I do threaten store closing a lot. I mean, I, not that the perception is that people think that. It's like, you want me to keep the store open, right? Um, and I think I do it in a silly, funny way. And it, and and the store is stable enough that, like, I, w I do worry about people saying that if the store looks like the shelves are bare and they've done a GoFundMe campaign and things like that. So you can't use that. You have to come up with something else because you don't want to joke about something like that if it's actually. Um, but I, you know, something to say, like, I think it's, especially if you're the proprietor, I feel like it's okay to say, to just throw them a compliment and hope that they understand. Mm. Right. Well, it's Do pretty better easy. Than me. It's easy to extricate mm. if there's another customer standing there and, and you can just excuse yourself and say, if you don't mind, I'm just going to help this person. It's when there's nobody else around. But it it's something that we emphasize with the booksellers is that when they're at the register, they should always have something else they can work on anyway because it's quiet um, some of the time. And so they, you know, we discourage just reading up there, write a shelf talker, you know, go have, have some paperwork of some sort. And then that gives you uh, something that can appear to be calling you back and make it easier to excuse yourself from a long winded customer. Well, we are pretty much out of time. Um, I'd like to ask if you have, three of you have anything else parting thought about um, basic sales techniques to say um, and then we can we can say goodbye or not no pressure <laughs> <laughs> you all have said a lot of things that's good so. it's hard to talk to people you can't see yeah <laughs> well um, i'm sure we're all we're all accessible if anyone wanted to email us separately if we weren't clear on anything, I'd be glad to email, you know, be an email correspondence with anyone. Great. Yeah, thanks. And then uh, well, yeah, I, yeah. the uh, some of you, I didn't get to your questions. I apologize, we ran out of time, but I will make sure that you get an answer to them. Um, and tomorrow I'll be uploading this to um, our website at bookweb.org. Um, it'll also be, um, BTW will make the announcement that it's available and they will provide the link as well. And I'll be sending you an email as well as a follow-up survey. Um, so thank you very much for participating and thank you to our panelists for doing a great job in discussing this important issue. And have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks.